There we go. So this presentation is an introduction of the tools you can use for downstream analysis and the quality control uh, you can do uh, during downstream analysis, at least when you have the count table. So now we have run cell ranger and we have our filtered count table. What's next? <clears throat> so these are, this is how, what a count table uh, can look like. So this is actual single uh, cell data. Um, I enriched it a little bit for genes with counts because also many genes often do not uh, have counts. So we have the genes in the rows and we have the cells in the columns. So all the cells, they are identified by the cell barcode. Um, I think this is by default 16 base pairs. Over here, I've specified only four, but typically the cell names, let's say, are the cell barcodes. And then we have the genes in the row, and then of course the counts, which are the unique UMIs, so basically the alignments, the deduplicated alignments, aligning to the gene in a certain cell. And of course, you can already see that there are quite specific expression patterns over here. So we probably have to do, deal with different cell types over here. For example, if we look at this C1QA and C1QC genes, I have to be honest with you, I don't know what they exactly are, but they are relatively highly expressed in the, in the third cell while they have no expression, or at least their expression is not measured in, in the first two cells. And and also have a look at, for example, e ENO1, which has a high expression in the middle one and also very low expression in the two other ones. So probably we can use, we can do stuff, right? With these expression profiles. But first, before we do that, we would have to do some quality control and uh, some uh, scaling and normalization, for example. So um, what kind of tools can you use uh, to uh, do this kind of analysis? Well, there are quite a few tools that you can use. A lot of tools have been developed in the recent years because you know single cell transcriptomics has gained a lot of popularity. So luckily there are also a lot of tools, which is very nice. What the, the typical tool does is that they perform at least the, the following. So they perform at least uh, quality control. They do some normalization and scaling because for example, you want to be able to compare genes in the same uh, scale, and you want to be able to compare cells um, and um, normalize, for example, by the number of reads you have generated per cell. So that's what normalization and scaling is about. And most of them also do some dimensionality reduction. So you have a nice um, two-dimensional visualization of your cell, like UMAP or TSNE. Uh, in Python, the most popular tool is uh, ScanPy uh, to do that. We won't be looking uh, into that uh, in this course, but there are very, a lot of very nice tutorials online. If you uh, are working in, let's say, the bioconductor universe, uh, typically you would work with a Skater and Trend in order to do your analysis. So that would be within our an alternative to that is Monocle 3, um, which also does a lot of similar things, not on Bioconductor, not even in CRAN, but um, still only uh, installable through GitHub. And I have to be honest, I doubt a bit on how much people still are investing in developing Monocle 3 further. Uh, but still, it is one of a package that is used very frequently, and it's particularly strong in doing, for example, trajectory analysis. But it's not only there for trajectory analysis, you can do also do typical quality control and um, dimensionality reduction with Monocle 3. And then the last one I wanted to mention, of course, it's not only these four, but these are the four most used as far as I know, is uh, Surat. Surat is on front, but not on bioconductor. Um, and it's also an R packet. And I think it's still the most used tool today to do single cell transcriptomics analysis. And they will also use Surat in R exercises. So 
uh, what do you typically do? What are typical analysis steps um, during a uh, single cell transcriptomic uh, analysis? So usually, um, in addition to the filtering that, for example, Cell Ranger already did, you do some additional uh, cell filtering can be based on number of detected genes, uh, number of reads, but also, for example, on the number of reads that are aligning to mitochondrial genes, for example. We will go into that later on. And then there is a normalization step. The normalization is, in, is where you normalize uh, per cell, per uh, the total number of reads or UMIs uh, generated per cell, so you can better compare compare them. Then there is usually a feature selection. And with feature selection, what I mean with that, or what the developers of Sura mean with that, is that you select the most variable genes, because usually you can do a dimensionality reduction. You can do it with all the genes, but it's just computationally much more efficient if you do it only with the most, most variable ones. So you pick a few thousand, usually a few thousand most variable genes, so that very most between cells and use those to do scaling. Scaling is important for dimensionality reduction. After the scaling, we do the dimensionality reduction with start with a PCA, the principal component analysis. More about that tomorrow, I think, right, Rochelle? And um, after the PCA, you continue usually with a UMAP or DSNE. Once you have that, you have a nice visualization. Typically, you continue with, for example, clustering. So you want, for example, to cluster cells together uh, that have the same type and annotation. So you want to see which uh, cell types you actually have. So specify which of the cells are the T cells, which ones are the B cells, and so on. And uh, of course, after that, you want to do differential gene expression, for example, very often, and then, of course, many other things. So in this course, um, what we, the tools we will use is mostly Surat to do uh, most of the steps, so including the filtering, normalization, feature selection and scaling. And for, for example, annotation, we will have a look at single R. And for differential gene expression, we will use Lima. And uh, for, for example, enrichment analysis, we will be using cloth profile. But most of the steps, especially today and tomorrow, will be done in zero. So a little bit more about uh, cell filtering. So what we have already seen, what cell ranger does, basically calls the cells. So it, it orders cells by uh, number, number of UMIs and tries to find this, this key drop in order to see, okay, these are cells and these aren't. But there are also other uh, ways to uh, filter cells. Uh, for example, if you find uh, a very high number of UMIs, this can also point to having, a, well, apparently a very complex library, and that could point to a doublet, so that you have, for example, two cells in there, so many different transcripts in there. Another um, way to filter uh, cells would, could be the number of detected genes. Um, maybe you do have a lot of reads in there, so a lot of transcripts were measured, but only very few genes were detected. Could point to empty droplets, but could also point to, for example, uh, cell types you don't want in there, like erythrocytes. Um, another, a third one could be mitochondrial UMI, so uh, reads that align to mitochondrial genes, typically. Uh, that could point to dying or very stressed cells. The reason for that is that uh, genes that are in the mitochondria, they do not, or the transcripts do not leak out the cell as quickly uh, if the cell membrane um, uh, becomes permeable. So those, those transcripts stay in the cell and therefore you relatively measure a higher number of mitochondrial genes. And, and that, therefore that can point to, to these dying or highly stressed cells. Typical people also look at ribosomal UMI. So uh, that would be the, the actual uh, 
um, I'm going to say this correctly, uh, for uh, genes that code for the ribosomal protein. Um, <clears throat> I don't, ha I haven't, I've never really found any good reason to use this percentage to filter for cells. Quite a lot of people do, but I'm not entirely sure why. And um, I, I'd be happy to hear an explanation on why, why you would want to do that. But still, it's a measure you can, uh, you can generate per cell. Another one could be uh, the percentage of uh, reads um, aligning to globin genes. And these, these could point to, for example, erythrocytes. And some, well, very often people do not really want these erythrocytes in the data set. And of course, what you can also do is look at the relationships between these variables. So for example, you want a low number of detected genes or a relatively high percentage of globin, and that could point to erythrocyte, for example, some stuff like that. An example uh, of that you can find over here, this is actually the data set you will be working with. So just to make that point, so we have here three samples, and we have the total number of UMIs per cell on the x-axis and the number of detected genes on the y-axis. And most of um, the, the relationship between the, the, total, the total count and the number of, feature, uh, number of features is relatively linear. So more uh, reads you have for a certain cell, the more genes you measure. So also lowly expressed genes are, are in there then. But there, apparently there is also a significantly big group with relatively high counts, but not a lot of detected genes. And probably it's because there are not a lot of genes expressed in these cells. So what could that be? Well, what we could do, for example, is at the same time generating the same plots, plot, but then um, color the cells according to the percent of globin globins, and then we see that most of those cells, they have a very high percentage of globin. So probably these are erythrocytes. So we have a an erythrocyte contamination. Whether you would call that a contamination, that's up to what, whether you were aiming for sequencing erythrocytes, yes or no. Yes, I think there is a question of general interest in the, in the Slack channel, so I will read it out loud. How sure. the cutoff for mitochondrial DNA has been determined and what if we expect mitochondrial DNA to be highly expressed? Example, if you have oxidative stress setting. Yeah, so about the cutoff. So you're saying, okay, we want to filter for, uh, filter out cells with high mitochondrial expression, let's say. So with, with a lot of reads coming from mitochondrial genes. Um, <clears throat> that very much depends on the data set. So typically um, what you do is you go back and forth in the analysis. So um, usually what I do, and I think Tanya and Rachel do very similar things, is you filter relatively mildly for mitochondrial. So you only take out the top, let's say, uh, highest expression. You continue with the analysis to the UMAP, for example. And then what you can do is color the UMAP, so the dimensionality reduction, or the clustering even, uh, based on the percent of mitochondrial reads. And if you then see a very clear cluster, of cells that are very high mitochondrial genes, those are most likely not, uh, they don't have the same cell type, but they are clustering together because they have such a high mitochondrial gene expression. Then you can say, okay, what kind of percent of mitochondrial genes do they have in there? And then you can go back to the filtering again and then uh, carry on. That's typically how you, how you decide because it just depends very much on the data set, what kind of uh, mitochondrial Genes you can expect how many what the percent can typically be my experience with tumor cells uh, is that mitochondrial gene expression can be typically high relatively high um, and for other tissues it can be expected to be very low i hope that is the question answered like this yeah great Um, so that about cell filtering and cell filtering, you typically do already with Surat and, um, Surat has a quite a specific way of storing your analysis in an 
object called zero object. So if you are a little bit familiar with R, you know that there are different types of objects in R, right? So you have, for example, data frames, you have vectors and you have lists. There are also more complex objects. Um, and an object is basically a set of rules what a certain type of um, certain type of data should look like. So we can do specific calculations on there. So a third object is an S4 object with, with slots. And within these slots, you can store different types of data. But all of these slots are always there in a third object, and they can be filled, yes or no. So what is always filled in a third object is the essays slot. So basically you can kind of consider uh, an object like this, an S4 object like this as a list, but this is not a list. This is basically a list of slots. That's how you can see it. And all these slots all have a name. So we have the essay slot and that essay slot has again a different uh, S4 class object called essay. And then that essay can have all again multiple slots among which the counts, which are the raw counts. So that's basically what, what was generated by Cell Ranger. Data is normalized data. Scaled data is scaled data. Var dot features are the variable features if you have selected them. If you haven't selected them, that slot is not filled. And some meta data about these features, which is not very frequently used. You have the wall count stored in the count slot or in the essay slot, normalized data, the skill data, and the variable genes or features. Then there is, you can store metadata per cell and you usually add metadata per cell during your analysis. For example, if you are clustering cells, so you want to specify clusters of cells that are more similar to each other than to the red, you specify that in the metadata slot. And a metadata slot just contains the data frame. So that's a very typical R object, which is just a table with, uh, um, with, uh, with columns specifying information about for each cell. So it can be the cluster, can be the total number of reads, it can be the, the annotation if you're further, all kinds of those things. So the information per cell is stored at the at meta.data plot. Um, then there is the graph slot because for now I will just skip active essay and active ident. I think I will uh, talk about it later. So in the at graphs uh, slot, you store the graphs that are used for the clustering. So if you are doing clustering, there uh, you can do the clustering. So specifying which are belong together with Zerot, and you can also store that in this same Zerot object. Then the dimensionality reduction. So those would be the PCA or the UMAP or the TSNE. Uh, you can store those together at the add reductions slot. And then again, you have a different class, is, which is the dim reduct class, also with its own uh, slot specifying information about the PTA, for example, well, we call those typically embeddings, but the coordination in the two dimensions, for example, in the UMAP. Then uh, a command, the, the slot that is not very frequently used, but I consider that to be very convenient, is the add command slot. And in the add command slot, you can store all the commands that have been run to generate the object you're looking at. So sometimes you get from a colleague, you get a third object, colleague did uh, her analysis um, and then gives it to you in order to, for example, do different gene expression analysis or whatever. But you do not really have a script, for example, but in that third command slot, there is uh, the commands are there uh, that were used to generate. Uh, this this particular object it can be very convenient to at least figure out the history of a syrup object. 
So then the active assay and active.ident slot, active assay um, refers to the assay uh, under, it gets under uh, counts, if I'm not mistaken. mistaken. So we can have multiple, no, no, it's, we can have multiple essays. I'm sorry. So we can have multiple essays. So we can have the, the standard essay, which is typically called RNA. And later on, if you're going to integrate multiple data sets, then we can have a second essay with only integrated data. The integrated data is used for dimensionality reduction, but not for, for example, different gene expression analysis. So therefore, we keep them separate. They contain different information. More about that tomorrow. The active ident um, is mainly used for plotting. So that is a column in the metadata plot. So over here in the metadata slot in the data frame, specifying which kind of metadata uh, information, for example, the original sample name you're uh, using, for example, during plotting a UMAP. So you can color according to sample name, for example. Uh, that is pretty much it. Project name, you always have to specify. That's pretty much it, what I wanted to discuss. All other slots are less relevant to you. Then a few words about normalization and scaling. So what's the difference between the two? Well, the difference is normalization is for self where you remove basically technical effects for self, usually that library size. So how many UMIs did you count for that particular cell? So you can, you're able to compare cells because for example, if you have generated a lot of reads for one cell, it becomes very difficult to compare it to a cell where you only have generated a few reads. Then there's uh, scaling. You do that per gene usually, where you standardize the range, the mean and the variance. And that is important uh, for principal component analysis. So typically you always uh, scale uh, your uh, observations for principal component analysis. Uh, so actually both normalization and scaling are mainly for the purpose of dimensionality reduction. If you continue to differential gene expression analysis, there's usually also a normalization and scaling step, but these are typically handled by the algorithm this, that is calculating uh, for example, the, the p values for you and the, and the log fold changes. One other thing you can do with a data set is regress out variables. Uh, that is typically done after you have visualized your data set uh, with, for example, a UMAP. And if you see that your uh, UMAP is more according to um, a variable that you're not interested in, you can try to regress it out. So what we typically see is that you have, um, depending a little bit on the data set, but you very often have cells in there that are that are dividing. So that are in, uh, I would you say this correctly, that are in the D2 or the S phase, right? Um, so, but you're not interested in clustering according to the cycling phase, but you're interested in, for example, clustering according to the cell type. Uh, so what, we, what, you, what you then see is that cycling cells that have different cell types, so let's say cycling B cells and T cells, they cluster together because their expression pattern is very similar because they're all cycling, but it's, they do not uh, cluster with the B cell and the T cell cluster. Well, maybe you want them to cluster together with the B cell and the T cell because you want to, to, to compare those regardless of whether they are cycling yes or no. So then you can regress that out. And there is a pretty nice uh, feature in Sura uh, that enables you to do that. Um, can be a bit challenging, uh, depending a little bit on the data set again, uh, that works very well or that doesn't work very well. If it doesn't work very well, you can always choose to take out the cycling cells, try to recluster those, re-annotate those, and annotate them again as a B cell or a T cell or whatever. 